All right. Looks like we are online. We're live and uh, and rolling. So, hello again to all of you who are participating. Uh, this is a Google Hangout, which will focus on wearable technology. I'm William Polk from Newark Element 14, and we have a couple of participants from around the world participating in the um, Get Closer Wearables Challenge, and those folks are here with us uh, today uh, in this Hangout. Um, the challenge is hosted by element14.com, uh, which is an online community of uh, makers and, and engineers. And um, today we are highlighting the projects from two of our competitors in the Wearables Challenge. Uh, they're based in Europe. Catherine Jones is uh, joining us from the UK. Uh, wow. she built a, um, or she's working on uh, a wearable technology piece uh, to uh, sort of generate engagement uh, in public settings like museums and, and other places. Uh, we also have Linda Caspers, who is joining from the Netherlands. Uh, she's working on a children's game uh, made of fabric that will help teach colors to children. And we're also joined by Becky Stern uh, from Adafruit Technology. Hi. So it, at this point, I want to hand it over to you, Becky, to give a brief overview of the program and uh, what Catherine and Linda and some of the other participants around the world are doing. Sure. So we're, with Adafruit Element 14 has been sponsoring this Get Closer Challenge, and it's a wearables challenge about our Flora Arduino compatible wearable electronics platform. And um, uh, competitors from all over the world or entrants um, submitted project ideas around the idea of bringing people closer together. And um, out of the 120 entrants, uh, eight were chosen, and several of them are in the EU, and we're lucky enough to talk to them today. And um, they have until, like, the end of September, right, and we're going to announce an overall winner of the challenge out of the eight contestants, and it's going really well so far. Um, these two can tell you more about their projects, but uh, over in the U.S., we have things like a geocaching hat, um, some fuzzy light-up family Halloween costumes, and just all kinds of really fun stuff happening with Flora, an, an umbrella with... Um, that looks like it's raining with lights, and um, really excited to see what projects you guys make and help you along the way. And yeah, get really excited about wearables. Great. Well, at this point, I uh, I wanted to turn it over to Catherine to talk a little bit about what you're doing, um, what uh, what technology you're using, what what the end what the end goal is. So, Catherine, go ahead and take it away. Hi there, my name is Catherine Jones. I'm an engineer at the Science Museum in London in the UK. Um, I started work last year. Um, I work as a what's called a new media engineer, so I look after um, a lot of like, the computer hardware and video systems and audio, and I'm also involved a little bit with the software in the, that goes in the museum. Um, recently, I've started reading a book called The Participatory Museum by a lady called Nina Simons, or Simmons, and it's all about how you can get sort of people involved in your museum, how they can be really a part of your museum, so they sort of you know, feed back into your, your museum a lot, and um, sort of thinking about some things around that, and a lot of what we do in the museum, you know, we ask people for feedback, we ask them to, if they've liked our exhibits, we ask them to sort of, you know, share their visits via sort of Twitter and Facebook. But a lot of things, sort of, in our museums, in a lot of museums like that, it's online, it's either online or it's in the gallery. It's not really that connected. You can't sort of see in the gallery by walking around if someone's liked an exhibit or, you know, what they think of that exhibit. It goes inside, you know, the, the terminals or it goes, it goes online. Um, I thought it would be really nice if you could come up with something so that people could actually see you know, what other people have liked as they walk around the museum. Um, so I started thinking about that and then the sort of, I don't know, it just sort of popped into my head this concept of, you know, I think it's like the, the phrase in the song, like, you wear your heart on your sleeve and just got my, my ideas buzzing. Um, I was just sort of looking for images and things like that and I came up with an idea of thinking about things like when people have sort of sort of these elaborate arm tattoos, these full sleeve tattoos, you know, they really are wearing the, you know, what they like and you know, what their emotions, their expressions on the actual sleeves. So I came up with something like that of having using LEDs and lights, that sort of thing, to you know, to show what you've liked in the museum. Um, so that was my sort of proposal for the you know for the project. And then when I got my um, Adafruit uh, Flora Flora Kate, 
sort of started exploring that a bit more and came up with the idea of using the, the NeoPixels and using the um, the colour sensor that you could, um, if you put sort of any sort of just coloured panels into the museum, uh, in the exhibits or a particular gallery or a particular area of your museum that you wanted to get that feedback from, that people could um, simply touch onto a, a coloured a coloured panel and the corresponding um, LED would light up on their sleeve um, so that that way people have you know, shown that they've liked an exhibit and also people in the museum can also see what other people have liked so they can sort of see what's popular and what they might want to have a look at so it's all that sort of area that I've, I've been exploring Great, thanks for all the explanation That's okay uh, Linda. Linda, why don't you talk a little bit about what you have been working on? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, what I've been working on is um, what's in house called, lovingly, the Crazy Color Cam. Um, it's basically a game for small children, like two to three years old. Um, I have it with me. Um, this. It's made out of uh, foam, and um, I clothe it with felt. What it, what it does is um, you have the color sensor and where normally you would find the lens you now find the color sensor. When a small kid um, holds it in front of let's say uh, uh, a red can uh, you can push the shutter but button and the color sensor senses the color and sends it to the back of the camera where you have four pixels that's the first, the few find the pixel that's where the, the, the color goes to. This is where, what shows the color that pick, was picked up by the sensor. You can um, hold it up a bit higher. Like that? Yeah, yeah or over to the side. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. So, um, you have like, the, 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 these three, they make up the game. So you have three colors. The first, or well, it randomly picked, one of the three has the same color as the few final pixel. The other two are randomly, well, sort of random, <laughs> randomly, um, uh, they pick other colors. And under that, there's three patches of the, um, uh, what's it called, conductive fabric? So those are, are the buttons, so it's very easy. Um, if you push the button underneath the same color as if you find a pixel, you hear like a woohoo, happy sound. And if you pick the wrong button, you hear a brr, you can pick one again and try again. Um, well, that's it, basically. It's very easy. Uh, well, at least it should be very easy for me. It's not. <laughs> I've never done anything with electronics. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I'm good with fabric, though. Fabric is easy, but electronics are not. <laughs> Well, that's actually a good segue into the next uh, sort of item on our, our rough agenda. Are you guys experiencing challenges that you wanted to discuss or, or ask Becky about? Uh, well, um, oh. <laughs> you go first, uh, Catherine. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, it's, for support, it's interesting for me. It's the other, it's the other, way, the other way around. I'm more comfortable like, with the electronics and the programming rather than the... Um, rather than the sort of, sort of sewing side of things, so I've been having to be careful. I've got most of my sort of stuff mocked up now and start writing the code and all that sort of stuff, but I saw sort of doing the, the actual sewing, so I've bought a couple of like sort of um, long sleeve tops and I'm sort of, sort of, sort of mock, mocking up how you do the sewing, but yeah, I was finding sewing frustrating. One thing I wanted to ask you about the, the conductive thread, now sort of reading things like the documentation for the, the NeoPixels is that um, about how many sort you, you can chain together and what the sort of lengths you can use with the thread, because it does say like the thread has like a, a resistance which can become significant, just any guidance on that? Yeah, sure. The um, NeoPixels, if you're just sewing with like a single strand, we say that you should only use like 10 on a single strand of like our 3 ply right. conductive thread. But we have um, a lot of different ways for adding a lot more. So there's a couple different projects I would point you to look at just for the conductive thread technique. Um, our Pixel Suspenders project has 30 pixels around a pair of suspenders. And then um, the Color Changing Scarf project has um, also a lot of pixels. And they both use this similar technique of um, putting lots of strands of conductive thread together, like four or three, and then um, 
laying them down on the surface of the thing you want to sew and running it through the sewing machine with a zigzag stitch oh, over right. top of the thread, and it like encases all of the thread. It makes like a power bus, and it's right. more. So is that, is that um, when you put the zigzag thread? Is that a zigzag thread of conductive thread? No, it's regular thread. So it's it just basically makes thread. a casing that holds this, you know, long multi-strand of conductive thread, and then uh, when you go to sew the pixels in, you can kind of tap into that uh, bus oh, with right. a yeah. sewing needle and conductive thread, so you're adding another ply to that power bus. Um, and then the data line's not such a big deal because it doesn't carry so much current, and it can be like a right. double strand of conductive thread is okay. But so look at those projects. We're adding, we're figuring out more and more ways to add more and more pixels on the same strand. Um, you can also make two, more than one strand on the same flora. Um, there's there's a couple different pins that are able to, um, you know, use the protocol for the NeoPixel. So like six and twelve, for instance, are right next to each other. I have a, I have a floor right here. With me. Um, so like, you always wire the pixels to BBAT and ground, but then also six and twelve can both do a strand. So you can like address them separately with different instances of the NeoPixel um, strip, yeah. and um, so you can like get around it that way too. But yeah, I like the zigzag method with the sewing machine. Ah, right, that's that's brilliant, Becky. Yeah, thanks for your help on that one. Linda, any questions? Um, yeah. Well, the the hardest part for me right now is to make sure that the um, the color sensor actually senses the right color, because I've noticed that when I hold anything. Um, in front of the sensor, the, the color that I get in the pixel is totally different. I go from um, something that's supposed to be blue to an orange, yellowish, pinkish color. Um, so that's that's my my biggest issue right now. So there's any ideas? So unfortunately for you, Linda, being the oh. novice, being the novice programmer, the the solution to your problem is actually a programming one, and. Um, uh, we have experienced, so the way the color sensor works is it samples the light coming into it, right? And, and mm -hmm. you just trigger the color sensor once, like the scarf code, for instance, does. It just, like, yeah. in a brief instant, um, measures the color. And then um, if there's any interference or reflection, if it's a shiny yeah. surface or the light that comes off of the color sensor is pointing in a weird direction and the surface isn't flat, you can get all kinds of weird results, as you have experienced. And our color-changing scarf works, like, 80% of the time to get like the right color, but we pick to show like particularly saturated bright colors because it is better at sensing that, and that's that's a fundamental truth of the hardware. But um, there are sampling algorithms you can use, and maybe we can do some research together online to find some samples of things like this that you could borrow from, um, where you have the color sensor maybe always sampling, and maybe um, it when you press the shutter button it samples for like even a whole quarter of a second could be like 10 or 12 readings. I don't know how fast it reads, but like you could get a bunch of readings and then average them together and you'd get more reliable color results because it would like, yeah. because you know, you're just like, the it's only sensing for the briefest moment and you kind of like, you want it to sense for longer. So that's the, that's how, like when we went over that with the color sensing scarf too and we decided to push the code out the way it is. Um, and um, develop for it. We're going to make another version of that project that uses a nice sampling algorithm. Okay. But the, 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 I, we had one idea to um, uh, see if that would work because we wanted to um, um, it, 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 it indeed make it sense a, a longer period of time, not just zap it, but, but for a, a while. And we wanted to um, see if we could um, have a, a, a LED next to it that would um, flash red, green, blue, so that it would pick up um, just just the red first, then the green, then the blue, to see if it. Um, would, yeah, I don't know if that will work because you you just that's like over engineering that it. That's like bringing yeah. this very sophisticated sensor and like and not using its sophisticatedness. Yeah. But um, I think that you could even write a simple code that would like say like, okay, go through a loop and read the sensor five times during the loop and store them into different oh, variables, yeah. reading one, two, three, four, and five, and then um, keep a rolling, like keep doing, that's your reading like mm -hmm. code, and keep doing it, have a rolling buffer where it like sets mm -hmm. the, and then you're constantly averaging like five values. Yeah get the color. And you might have to break them down into the, when the colors come in, you might have to average R, G, and B channels, but I don't think you need to solve it with more 
hardware. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, that's good to know, because then I can... Um, uh, that was sort of what I was waiting for, to um, be able to, to continue with uh, the felt and the foam. <laughs> because if I have to add more hardware, I can continue to, um, to right. actually make the camera. <laughs> so, okay, that's a good thing. Thank you. Just another quick question then about the, the color sensor. What is it like in different lights? I mean, because at the moment I'm just sort of testing it in my house, which is like a just got like an energy saving bulb on it. I mean, does it is it better or worse in like sort of daylight or sort it of? It emits its own light, so it's kind of, and the light it emits is quite bright. So yeah, it yeah, really, it kind of blows out anything. It doesn't it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Can you consistent. turn that light off, folks? Yeah. So in the sensor code, you, there's there's a way to turn it off, like to, it, yeah. to just turn it on when you're sensing, and then turn it off again. Right. If you look at the like our uh, chameleon scarf code does that. It like turns it on at first, does a little countdown, takes the reading, and then turns the light off. Ah, right. So I there's very, also I think, uh, code in the um in the color sensor tutorial for it just to be constantly on and constantly reading and cha like live changing. And then there's another project that. Um, my colleague Colin worked on that's this color piano, and it's a glove with the color sensor on uh, the yeah, finger that, yeah. and um, the flora on the hand. And um, you, uh, it like has a pixel on the back of the finger that live shows what color it's sensing. Um, but that doesn't, again, it doesn't have a rolling buffer. It's just live showing you. Oh, cool. Thank you. Linda, how are you planning to do your conductive fabric buttons? Are you mm -hmm. going to use capacitive touch sensing? Uh, um, what? <laughs> I, yeah, I, no, I read that. Yeah, I was. I, I can actually show you. Um, this is what I have so far. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. Um, are your buttons working? They are. They are. I just managed this week, and I'm very, very pleased with them. They work excellent. Um, it took me about three hours to, to get them to actually work, but since it's me, it's not saying anything because most of the things take me a long time. But they work. They work very well. Yes. Yeah, I'm very happy with them. Yeah. It's awesome. It's a really fun yeah. way to add um, interaction to your project in a soft way because, um, like previously, before all these, you know, like this capacitive touch sensing code is pretty sophisticated and it wasn't. It hasn't always been around, and so you used to have yeah. to make like a fabric. A physical fabric switch with like two layers of conductive fabric and like a, per a perforated piece of foam in between them, and then you'd have to squeeze them, and they're kind of inconsistent, and they would go bad if the foam deflated. And um, the capacitor touch sensing is way better, where it's just either, that your body is made out of water, and your electromagnetic disturbance triggers the sensor. It's really cool. Yeah, it works absolutely fine. Uh, I, I really like the um, the fact that I can just um, sew it with the conductive thread, uh, thread and just um, I, I only need one um, uh, piece on the uh, on the floor. I just uh, I use the D12 and the TX. I just need one, which is good because now I can fit everything I need on the one floor, <laughs> which uh, yeah makes it a lot easier for me. So no, that's good. That's good. I only I, I added one um, one big button. The, uh, the shutter button. I, I, first of all, I wanted to make it out of the uh, conductive uh, fabric as well, but I, I really wanted something that you can just really push, you know? So I, I, I used a, a real button for that. Yeah. I think it'll look nice on the top of the camera. I hope, I hope, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Catherine, um, last I checked, you were working on like ways for users to like pick up or drop off a uh, an opinion or a, or a vote. Did you want yeah. to talk about your methods of, of uh, interaction there? Yeah, so I think what I've, I've been looking at, because I mentioned in my sort of introduction, is that uh, because sort of different galleries have sort of different themes, that you would sort of add simple, um, like when you have sort of objects in a gallery, they have, they have labels, and the idea is that you would sort of colour code each label, um, and then you could just by matching up your you, you colour to an object, you sort of you know, sense that colour, and then when you, you your colour sensor picks up the colours, there, right, that is that uh, you know that particular object. So just build up a table of object to colour, and just build up a list of everything that, that someone has um, as light by you know which which colour which colours they've actually light, 
Um, and then that got me on that thing of like, you know, we, we... Uh oh, Captain Freeze for anyone else. Yeah, she did. Linda, are you still there? Yeah, I am. It was just too much. It was. Too much. <laughs> oh, there she is. Oh, you're saying, back. I was gonna say you had just so many ideas, you broke the internet. Oh yeah, yeah that's by yeah, no problems. I think it just timed out some of the museum uh, wireless network. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I got the idea of be, being able to sort of you know sort of show show your um, your um, you know show show what you've liked. But then what I'd also like to do, I don't know if I'll get this done for the project, it may be sort of a bit of sort of back end and sort of server side, all that sort of thing, is being able to sort of push out what you've you know, what you've liked up to the internet. Um, maybe either having some sort of station at the end where you can sort of download your colours that you've liked or have some sort of Wi Fi connection where you can it will do it sort of sort of automatically. I think with the sort of from what I can understand, like the sort of like the you know, the floor doesn't really support any like sort of Wi-Fi connections, but I thought you know maybe possible that you could have something similar to your color sensor the other way around and some sort of flashing lights where you could send out you know pulses of, of lights to a to a station, um, you know, and then that would sort of upload it, you know, to to, to the internet. So you got that sort of saved experience on the internet that other people can look at, that you can look at, that can be you know shared around. Do you think about um, like getting that data back into the public? You you don't necessarily have to keep it digital the whole time. Like you don't have to upload your your color to the internet. You could possibly go like a from because like you're entering the analog world, right? You're like wearing your yeah. analog, you're you're expressing in the physical world your opinion, and maybe you want to capture that with a photograph. You could either have oh, you could have a photo yeah. booth, and the photo booth. Yeah. Um, Maybe then you get a link to your picture on the museum Facebook page, and then you could look at—I don't know—it's like more of a, um, you know, that you can't show like bars graphs very easily that way. You'd have to do like image uh, color detection on the image itself, which would be kind of a software tangle. But like, if you're looking to have like, if you look at what kind of social results you're looking for. If you're looking for people to yeah. be able to look at a bar graph, that's one thing. But if you want people to have a social experience of, and have discussions about the things that they discovered at the museum, I don't know—that could be one. Route you'd consider. Ah, right. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, just showing. Yeah, I know. I, I think I think I've skipped the simple stuff a bit there. I'm gonna like let's just upload it and let's, let's analyze it and yeah, yeah. But I mean, like if you had a photo booth on their way out where they could like show off, they wore the wearable at the museum and then they take a picture and it gets emailed to them and posted on the museum Facebook page. That's actually a pretty simple. Yeah, because we have a pull off. Yeah, because we have uh, we have a, what's called a latest event once a month that runs, and we have sort of photo booth events at that where some people can quite often dress up as sort of a sometimes you know a themed around the, the theme of the lights, and yeah, and people photo booth is already is always popular. That's we, we don't have a, a permanent photo booth, but yeah, it is something that would be yeah we, we would I think we would look at definitely if we were yeah doing anything like this. I mean, and if someone was interested, they could like look at all of the weekend's photographs and say like. And do the math and be like, look, 65% of people liked the red exhibit. Yeah. And make little snippets like that, but it, it wouldn't be as, I mean, yeah. It's about what's yeah. important. It's the data more important yeah, than social experience. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thanks for that, Becca. <laughs> I keep saying this. It, it, I really like your uh, your project. I, I used to do stuff for museums, um, since I, I do stuff for art museums mostly. Um, and. I, I keep seeing this very dark room with this sort of pillar in the middle and seats around it that and the pillar keeps changing color because other people are going to the different um, um, uh, places in, in, in the gallery and keep liking different things so the colors constantly change and people sitting there constantly see what other people like and yeah that's the sort of thing that I see <laughs> Right, yeah, that's a, a bit of yeah, art. Echo, echo back to you know, thinking what, what people have liked as well. So that's mm -hmm. a good idea. You could uh, achieve that in a, I mean, in a not, you know, my elect regular electronics brain is around too. Um, you can achieve that by having like buttons that, you know, like a like button at every station, and then the, the color is still associated yeah. with that station and affects the colors of a central location wired. It's just a lot of wire to run around the room, yeah. but you know, um, cause it's simpler than doing a wired. Um, or wireless chips and stuff, which are there's a lot of interference and they're yeah. expensive. Yeah, I suppose with that, that you've got the 
light in the colour sensor, so all it would take would be your, your panel just to have a, a sensor in that and just pick up that there's a bright light at it. So, yeah, someone's shined a bright light at this yeah, panel. Yeah, that too. Oh, yeah. You light. can do that with, like, a photo cell, like a yeah. photo. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah, because then it's, like, it senses the white light and that someone... Yeah, it's going to be a lot brighter than just the ambient light around it. So, yeah, someone's like this exhibit. I'd want to, to this exhibit as likes. That's clever. <laughs> It's like you're looking at me, or I'm looking at you, kind of thing. All right. Like it knows when it's being looked at. Could just uh, was a question for for you and Linda is um, about the the sewing of the um, like the, the conductive threads. Uh, any sort of tips with that? Cause like I said, I'm not. I've got like a, a sewing machine. I'm not a great expert. I'm quite worried about the doing the machine sewing with the, the threads. Any particular tips on that? Uh? Well, I I used um, just a simple needle. Actually, I used right. the needles that came with the kit. <laughs> right. I have loads of needles, but I used that. Those in, they're you've pretty not, good. You've not machine sewed anything? Uh... Not, not for this project, no. No, and it works It works excellent by hand. It works very well. Um, I would practice, Catherine, on some scrap fabric. Yeah. And you can put the two-ply conductive thread in the bobbin of your sewing machine, but it's not the. it doesn't give you the best result. The, the zigzagging is really good if you want to do a lot of pixels. Um, and even if even if you want to do a few pixels, it's um, uh, it makes things go a bit faster, and you get like a nice straight power and ground bus that are like the right distance apart, and then you can tap into it with your pixels. Um, right. But just practice on on some scrap fabric that's flat and and uh, like woven. Not I, I working with knit fabrics is pretty tricky since the circuit doesn't really stretch. Right. Yeah. Cool, thank you. All right, well, unless there are any other topics of discussion, I think we can probably wrap up. I'll, I'll give anyone uh, one last shot at raising any questions or concerns that they've got. No, I don't think I've got anything else, but, yeah, it's been really good to do this. We'll talk to you guys. I've been really enjoying reading your blog posts. I look forward to seeing more of them, and um, I've been posting some of your stuff on the Adafruit blog, too. Ah, great, thank you. Oh, one question. Um... I noticed on the on the age of, on the sorry, on the element fourteen, um, some of the blogs are coming up as I think it's um, it, that's a small section at the top that's got um, it shows the ones that have got tagged as wearables or one of the wearable tags and I think I tagged it, it didn't seem to come up. Okay, I can mention that to to Christian who's who's uh in yeah I thought be, I thought be all your your tags, okay, cool. but when I see it, I seem to tag it, mine just didn't seem to come up. Uh, okay, I'll follow up on that for you. Okay, that'd be great. I had the same problem, but you have to use the right tags. <laughs> that's, right. that's what I, yeah, I, I used a, a similar tag that it, it said something like wearable challenge, but it, it was it, it wasn't oh, another right. tag that was very what similar the exact to tag it. Tag is, and then he'll tell you again what it exactly is. It's probably just because the the tag wasn't isn't obvious. Okay, thank you very much. Anyway, it was lovely to talk with you ladies, and thanks, William, for hosting and. Um, Look forward to looking at your progress later. Okay, thanks very Definitely. much, guys. Thank you. This was a good discussion. Thanks for all your time. And for anyone uh, watching, you can find out more about the contest and uh, wearable technology on the Adafruit blog as well as the uh, Element 14 community, element14.com. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Thank My you. Pleasure. Bye. Bye-bye. Good luck. I'll talk to you Thank soon. Thank you.